Welcome to the Radio of Horror Show here at WCUW in Worcester, Massachusetts. If you have caught my podcast, the Dead TV podcast with Mr. Zeneca, then you're familiar with my guest who came on the show for that to talk about alienation. But tonight we're talking about uh, some of his non-alien related uh, science fiction and uh, one little obscure piece of horror uh, that's actually somewhat connected to the image behind me that he... <laughs> that he was about to spill the beans on, but mainly also talk about the, the 45th anniversary of one of the TV shows that he created, as well as talk a little bit about some of his books that he's worked on too. If you didn't catch the Dead TV podcast, he'll go over some of those here as well. Uh, Kenneth Johnson, producer, writer, uh, TV kind of legend, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you, you, no, you've got to no. know that you have no. legendary status. You created five of the most iconic television shows of all time. That's uh, uh, that's thank you for the compliment. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I can only credit it to the fact that I am uh, very wise enough to try to surround myself with the most talented and creative people that I can find, Chris, and then listen to them. What a concept! And uh, uh, and make uh, projects that collaboratively uh, end up. Uh, sort of being long lasting things that have stood out in people's memory. It's, uh, uh, it's incredibly rewarding to, uh, to, to have had that opportunity and, uh, and to work with so many people who have made me look a lot better than I deserve to. Behind you, I can see all sorts of pictures from all your accomplishments. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, that's a few. That's a few of the uh, uh, the main titles from uh, from some of my stuff. There's uh, there's too many to put up on all the walls. And, the, and oh the stuff yeah, but you can you can clearly make out obviously the Bionic Woman, the Incredible right. Hulk behind you on your le on your left shoulder, and V. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's true. That's I got a sort of sort of surrounded by V, and and all the photos uh, in the background, as you can see, going up the stairs to uh, to the upstairs part of the offices here. Uh, that, that's <laughs> those are all. You know, I sometimes think, Chris, and I maybe I said this to you before, that I got into this business just so that I could have pictures of myself doing this business, and uh, and with all of my pals that uh, that I I was so lucky to be involved with, and. Uh, uh, so every day uh, when I come in here to the offices, I, I get to sort of have the uh, the career flash before me, and I stop on the stairs uh, when I'm going up to my own office up there. Uh, that uh, just to look at the faces and uh, and remember all the folks that uh, um, you know I was so lucky to work with. Right. I mean, I got my own behind me. You can't really see it because I can't figure out how to turn the virtual camera on. <laughs> <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> but I have covers to my comics, my books, artwork from uh, my more recent publications involving the thing behind me, Vlada, a Dracula tale. We flip the, the, flip the genders of Dracula. But before we get mm -hmm. to the Incredible Hulk, it was yeah. very funny when I was going through your IMDb and I knew the things that I knew you from. But then I was like blown away when I found out you had done a Dracula show as well. And as you just said to me, it was the most expensive TV show ever made at the time? Well, yeah, uh, you're talking about cliffhangers. Um, I got a call from, uh, this was after I was uh, in the midst of doing the Bionic Woman and the, and the Bionic shows, and, uh, um, and, I, uh, and also the Incredible Hulk. Um, uh, I got a call one day from Freddie Silverman, who was then running, um, which one was he running? ABC, I guess. Uh, and he was, uh, he said, hey, I got an idea and I think you would be the right guy to talk to about it. Uh, he said, w wouldn't it be, how would you feel about doing a show where in one hour there were three separate 20 minute chapters of three separate serials? And, uh, and I said, well, Fred, you've come to the right person because as a kid, that's how I would spend my Saturdays in the early, in t early television in, in the 1950s. They would play the old Republic serials back to back. Uh, and you'd get a chapter from, uh, the, you know, Tailspin Tommy and the Great Air Mystery. And then you get a, a, a chapter of Don Winslow of the Navy. And you'd get uh, some cowboy one, uh, or Gene Autry or something. And, and um, uh, and when I was a producer director at New York in New York at WPIX in New York, how I really started my career uh, back in the '60s, uh, I discovered that PIX had a huge room vault full of all these old Republic serials that I loved, and uh, and I, I went back and I, I said uh, to the management there, I said, let me do a documentary about cliffhangers. And I did. I, I, I looked at like 60 or 70 hours of old Republic serials reliving my childhood while I did it, Chris. 
and and I put together a documentary back then uh, that aired. It was local in New York and, and syndicated a bit. Uh, but so I told Fred uh, Silverman that I certainly had a, a background in cliffhangers, but I said, I don't understand how you think you can afford to do that because uh, that's going to involve a whole lot of people and uh, uh, and talk of, you know, cost a lot of money. Um, and in, indeed it did uh, because there was no model for that kind of a show. Uh, the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, they all had models for a half hour show or a one hour show, but nobody had a model for a one hour show that had three 20 minute sections of it that were in fact gonna all end up as a series being done by three separate shooting companies simultaneously. Uh, and uh, plus I had the Incredible Hulk going at the same time. Um, and it was, uh, so instead of costing about, um, oh, I'm on maybe around $500,000 per hour, uh, cliffhangers was going to cost about uh, a million five an hour, which was just out of the realm of possibility. But Freddie was which is very funny for... considering you think about like an episode of Mandalorian or Game of Thrones today oh, cost wow. about $10 million an episode. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and we are talking about $1977 when we say 1. 1.5, which is probably now equal to maybe uh, about five or six million. Uh, but um, uh, but at any rate, uh, we did we did we did I did do the movie pilot. I wrote it over a weekend. Actually, uh, I uh, had a great fun deciding which ones I wanted to do uh, and how I wanted to do it. And uh, uh, and one was a sort of a contemporary Perils of Pauline. That's the one with Susan Anton. Uh, the second one was the Dracula one that you that you reference, which was sort of a romantic take on uh, on Dracula. Uh, with a sort of quasi-sympathetic character. Uh, and then the last one was a science fiction Western where we discovered that there was an underworld uh, and uh, uh, that was very, very advanced and high tech in the 1880s of, of Wyoming uh, or Montana, wherever I said it. But the, it's, it's sort of hard to talk about cliffhangers because nobody can really see it anymore except on YouTube and uh, and that's uh, that's the uh, that's the only place. And the visual the visuals are not very good on that uh, YouTube. Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't find it whatsoever. Now, uh, here's a great question um, because I'm trying to be a showrunner for a TV show documentary uh, right now, and there is so much I need to do. And I go to my nine to five, and then I come home and I work on the TV show. I'm trying to find people as a showrunner, as a creator. Uh, of like the Incredible Hulk, <laughs> let's just stick with that because obviously that's mainly what you're on here for. Um, what are the hats you have to wear? What do you have to do? <laughs> the it's it's funny. Um, um, my first love and interest has always been directing, as I probably talked to you about before on when we were talking about Alien Nation. I, I always saw uh, saw myself as a director. Uh, that's what I really enjoyed doing. And um, uh, and writing came, I was dragged kicking and screaming to uh, writing by my pal, Stephen Bochco, who had been a classmate with me at Carnegie Mellon um, and in the drama department there. Uh, and I really didn't think I could do it. Uh, bec but, but when I first came to California after having some success in live television in New York and producing the Mike Douglas show when I was 25 years old, and it was the huge only daytime 90 minute talk show six times a week, blindingly uh, busy. Um, I came out here and said, okay, here I am ready to make movies. And Hollywood said, oh, no, no, you're a talk show producer. And I said, no, no, wait, I'm really a filmmaker. Uh, and I had done some film stuff, but not a narrative stuff. And, uh, uh, and I discovered that uh, if you were an actor, you could do bit parts and work your way up. And if you were a writer, you could write on spec, hoping somebody would buy it. But if you were a director, they either gave you the money or they didn't. And until you did it for somebody else, they wouldn't give you the money to direct. So I, uh, I came, I became a writer, uh, you know, out of necessity more than anything else. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's, you know, sort of how I, I skated into it. And the bionic woman uh, came about because of uh, Steve Bochco introduced me to a guy named Harv Bennett, who was doing the $6 million man. I came up with the idea of uh, the bride of Frankenstein and, uh, and let's create a female counterpart. And that's where she came from. And suddenly I was, uh, Harv asked me to, maybe I told you this, but if not, I'll tell it quickly. Harv had asked me to join Six Million Dollar Man as a writer producer. And I said, let me just write and direct. You know, producing is kind of a pain in the neck. And Harv said, no, let me explain, Kenny. Uh, when you are the producer, that's the person that gets to hire the writer and the director. 
And that sounded really appealing to me. <laughs> I could actually hire myself to direct and wouldn't have to wait for somebody to do it. Um, so, so I took the job, but I quickly discovered that when you are doing an episodic television show um, as the producer, uh, you're actually like the, the uh, admiral of the fleet uh, because you've got to make sure that you get out uh, 20 or 22, one, uh, 22 hours of episodes in nine months, which means they've got to be uh, thought out I, the ideas have to be come up with, have to, you know, and and then they have to be stories have to be written, and then the scripts have to be written from the stories, and then they have to be prepped uh, for each uh, half hour episode or one one hour episode rather, and uh, and then you're shooting, uh, and at the same time you're doing all of the getting ideas and creating the stories and creating the scripts and starting to shoot. You're also doing the post production on the ones that you've just shot. So it, it, it's really like a three ring circus, circus uh, in three dimensions. <laughs> There's so much stuff going on all the time. And, uh, and people say, hey, congratulations, you sold a series. And also, by the way, the bad news is you sold a series, which means you've now got to execute it. And the reason I mentioned directing first, uh, uh, Chris, is because that's what I selling love doing. Selling a series that. helps, though. I mean, selling a series also means you get money to hire people, so you're not completely doing everything yourself, too. That's true, but at the same time, you've uh, when you're doing a series as the showrunner, you've got to be the admiral that's making sure the fleet is sailing in the right direction all the time, and all the pre stuff is getting going, and the scripts are getting going, and the shooting is going okay, and uh, and the post is also happening simultaneously. And when you're doing all of that and have have to watch all of those moving parts at the same time, one does not have time to go and spend a couple or three weeks directing. Um, and <clears throat> that was my my great frustration. And uh, so very and almost every time I did a movie pilot, it sold and went to series. And every time it sold, I swear to God, I, I said, Chris, gee, um, couldn't couldn't you just couldn't we just do another pilot on another movie and uh, for something else because the idea of having to uh, be on that uh, in that garbage disposal of uh, of episodic television was really really stunning. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, to back to your question, delegation. Yes, of course you have to hire find people. You have to find people that you want to hire. Then you have to convince them to come on board. Uh, and generally, uh, for in, the, in the case of cliffhangers, um, I hired, I think, 16 or 17 writers all at one time because I had three different shows going and we oh, needed some, we had we had, had to have full writing staffs for three different series at the same time. Uh, so how one is. Enough. On, and how many writers were on Hulk? Um, there was me as a writing producer, executive producer, director. Uh, there was Jim Parriott. Um, there, and that's how it started with me, just me and Jim and, um, uh, and the bionic woman also started that way. And at the time we would then uh, often, there were, there were not the writer's rooms that you see now, you know, where there are 14 writers on staff and half of them have producer titles. Right. And they get like a whiteboard and the yeah, yeah, and... yeah, we, yeah, we, we had all that, we, we, uh, we had all of that stuff, but there were only usually a couple of us trying to figure it out. Uh, we also brought in a, uh, a story editor, uh, and, um, uh, and it was one of the guys that had graduated from Cliffhangers, as a matter of fact, Andy Schneider, uh, who went on to do Magnum and Fall Guy and all kinds of other things, has been doing Chicago Med now that he and his wife Diane created for uh, Dick Wolf uh, about five years ago now. I think they've had a long run on that. Um, so Andy came in as a story editor, and so there now there now were three writers working, and occasionally we would farm a script out to uh, to outside writers because uh, you were always looking for good um, you know uh, uh, writers that could bring you an idea and could execute it in a way that really would work for the for the show, and that's the hardest. Those are the hardest people to find. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Harv glommed onto me quickly and wanted to make me a writing producer because. It's hard to find those guys and women that can do uh, that can do the job, uh, because don't forget, all of the other series in television are also looking for those same writers. So the the uh, the pool is uh, uh, it gets shallower and shallower with the more and more shows that go on. So eventually, we had a number of outside writers that came in, and there were some real success stories among those. 
Um, when I first got the Hulk up on, on the air, the uh, president of Universal Television, Robert Harris, um, said, hey, Kenny, would you mind doing me a favor? He said, my, my sister, Karen, uh, she's starting out as a writer. She's got a partner, uh, uh, Jill Sherman, and, and they have, a, have an idea for the Hulk. Would you, would you at least just let them come in and pitch you the idea and see what you thought about it? And I said, of course, uh, because, you know, who knows? So they came in, uh, Karen and Jill, and they pitched me this idea. It was really pretty good. So I said, okay, we made a deal with them and said, write the story. They wrote the story. It was pretty good. We had to mush it around a little bit to get it to kind of fit together properly, but it did. And uh, and then they wrote, the, 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 then I sent them off to write the script. And they, they came and the script came in and it was kind of a mess. And I and I and we were in a hurry. And so what often happens in times like that is that either Jim or uh, or Andy or myself would take the outside writer's script and rewrite it uh, so that it would work for the show and and hit all the points that it had to make. Uh, and we didn't get additional credit for that or additional money for it. Uh, the writers always you know got the credit, but it was a very different script in a lot of ways than what Karen and Jill had written. And, uh, and, and I called him and I told him that, and I told him what the story was and why. And I brought him in, uh, Chris, and had him sit down with me. And, and we went through the script page by page from their original to what I had written and why I had made the changes that I had made. So that it could be a learning experience for them. And I thought, okay, I've done my good deed and, and they're talented ladies and God, Godspeed. And about two weeks later, Karen called me back and said, hey, we got another idea. And my first reaction was, oh, okay, here we go again. But this time they came in, the right, the, the idea was really good also again. Uh, this time uh, I said, yes, let's do it. They wrote the story. The story was a lot tighter, more together, more where it needed to go. And then they wrote the script. And it was way better than their first attempt had been at uh, their first script. Um, and it was so good, in fact, that we went to them back, back to them a couple of times as outside writers, as we called them. And then uh, I uh, asked if they would like to join the show as a story, I think we started with story consultants or something. And then we moved Andy up to executive story consultant and they became the story editors on the show. And after two more years, Karen and Jill were producing the Hulk and writing the shows uh, alongside me. And uh, Jim had by then gone off and, and to start his own stuff going. But so it's an example of how you really look for the people that can deliver for you and and nurture them and uh, uh, and try to help them along so that they can help take the burden off of you. And in my case, so that I can have some time to direct too, just from a selfish point of view. I I met um I met at Comic Con uh, in 2019, so just before the pandemic. Uh, are you familiar with the actor Nicholas Hammond? No, tell me about. It. He played Spider Man. Okay in the show alongside the Hulk. <laughs> okay. And he said that there was, there were, there was a talk about doing a Spider-Man Incredible Hulk crossover because show both shows were running concurrently. Don't recall that ever happening. And I would never, it never would have happened on my watch. That's for sure anyway, because what I was trying to do with the Hulk from the beginning was to, uh, make it live and breathe in the real world. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I, I was not a big comic fan of comic book stuff. So I'd never heard of the Hulk at all. And a, a lot of people hadn't. It was one of the lower tier of the, yeah. uh, the Marvel characters at the time. Stan told me, I didn't really realize it. And, uh, and it, it was you know, the ones that I was offered because uh, Universal when the Bionic Woman was doing so well, uh, called me in to, uh, to say, we've just acquired the rights to the five, five of the Marvel comic superheroes. Incidentally, Chris, for which they paid, I think it was something like $15,000. That was all they paid oh my God. for the rights to Captain America, uh, Ms. Marvel, the Human Torch. Uh, Ms. Marvel, like Carol Danvers? Like the uh, one that became guess, Captain I, Marvel in the movie? See, I remember, I remember Mary Marvel from the Captain oh, Marvel. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. So Mary Marvel is DC, Fawcett Comics. That's the that's Black Adam and Shazam. Well, and then no, there sure, is but... a Miss Marvel, Carol Danvers. That's who became Captain Marvel in the big budget movie in theaters. Right, that's right. Which okay. was, uh, and I, I get why people get confused about it because there's right. so many Marvels and whatever. And and I try to explain to someone like, 
why who so Shazam is the name of the character that Black Adams fights and I'm like right. no, no it's Captain no. Marvel but it's a whole legal mumbo jumbo thing that I don't yeah. want to explain no but that's it but I what I was trying to do with the, when um first of all I, I wanted to say no and I mean maybe you've heard this story uh, uh but and I'll keep it quick but um, I didn't want to do any of them. I didn't like spandex and primary colors. I didn't want to do comic book shows. I wanted to do serious stuff. I wanted to do serious big dramas. And, yeah, I didn't and hear that. And that's fine. If you're not a comic yeah. book fan, you're not a comic book yeah, fan. Yeah, right. Well, I was when I was a kid, but not as an adult writer. And I and I always have to try to write stuff that I would want to see. That's how I've always written is what would I like to see? Right. And that's and, why a lot of people say, oh, that's why the Hulk is so different from the comics because Ken Johnson wasn't a comic book fan. And I'm like, well, he's coming on the show. I'll certainly ask him that. <laughs> That's right. That's it's true. It's true. I mean, I hadn't read comics since I was a kid. I loved the DC characters. My year, my era of comics was before Marvel, you know, came into being. And so I wasn't familiar with all of them later. But what I was familiar with was were the comic book tropes of the uh, the alliterative names of Clark Kent, Lois Lane, Lex Luthor, Peter Parker, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. And that's one of the reasons I, the, the prime reason that I changed the name of Bruce Banner to David Banner, uh, because and it had uh, nothing to do with like the the name was too homosexual or something like that. Because that was a constant well, yeah, I could see I could see how there could be a certain homosexuality attached to the name Bruce. Well, I mean, you think about guys like Bruce Willis and Bruce Lee and Bruce Wayne. Yeah, they're sort of sort of uh, uh, yet. Yeah, come on. You know, no, it had zero to do with any kind of uh, a gay slur or anything that was like that. The dumbest thing I ever heard, even as a kid, when I understood that, you know, gay is whatever, you know what I mean? And, and you're taught as a young age, whatever. And then as you get older, you kind of learn just let people be who they want to be yeah, and do yeah. what they want to do and be who they want to be and so on and so forth. Um, you know, like the, the values of Stan Lee, let's just say. Uh <laughs> well, exactly. And, and Stan understood what I what I wanted to do it. He said, you want to change the name of my character? I said, yeah, I do, Stan. And here's why. And he understood it. I said, I'll put him on the tombstone. You'll see him every bit at the beginning of every show. David Bruce Banner. OK, <laughs> it's his middle name. But but let me let me pull him more into the real world. And, and he's uh, used David in the comics at some point, too, by the way. Is it alias? Oh, did he? Oh, OK. Yes, David well, has been I also, used yeah, they also made times. A, they, they um, also made a Red Hulk, finally, I heard, uh, which is. Yeah, uh, what, that, that's uh, that was uh, what's funny. So, you know, the actor William Hurt, he passed away recently. He, yes. in the comic books, does become Red Hulk. Now, in the upcoming, whatever it's going to be, Harrison Ford <laughs> is replacing him. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, and maybe we'll get a Red Hulk. I, I don't know. I mean, well, you know, because it was so frustrating because I, it just didn't, it wasn't logical to me. I said, Stan, what, what is he, the envious Hulk, the jealous Hulk because he's green? You know, is he? But well, I, said, well, Stan, I did want to ask you about this, though. Did you see what happened on She Hulk? Oh, I saw that the uh, the the, the, main the, the main title did. I did not. I didn't. I've never seen the show, but I oh, did. Okay, see yeah, the last episode they did an entire homage with her in the chair, the yeah, you know, the cross yeah, thing I on the head, and her lifting yeah. the car up. I saw it. It was it was flattering, and I appreciated that uh, homage. Uh, it was a little peculiar to me uh though the the oh the one that I really loved is what you have probably seen is what Family Guy did. When they completely remade the main title, and uh, and it's all animated, and it's exactly shot for shot my full main title in animation. If you, if you haven't seen it, just Google Family Guy Hulk opening. Yeah, I'll have to. I don't because I'm not recollecting. Oh, and it. you can even you can even see them side by side. You can see mine and uh -huh. theirs because uh, they had all, they had done one a year before where they, their closing credits were animated. Yeah, with, with Stewie. That's yeah, with Stewie walking road, with Stewie, Stewie walking away, hitchhiking. Poor Stewie and Joe Arnell's music. They even used our music. It was right. great. And they did that in the Incredible Hulk movie with Edward Norton as well. Uh, like <laughs> after he gets, uh, you know, after he has to run away from Brazil, he's on the side of the road hitchhiking. And they used, I mean, and the it's theme. now in the Marvel MCU canon the, the 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 origin of the Hulk for that with him trying to recreate Captain America Super Soldier Serum is again with him in the chair. It's going up. It's got that cross. Well, Please yeah, I heard. Yeah, you know, it's frustrating. I uh, the fir I was at the premiere of the first movie. Uh, I think I probably did. I tell you about that one. Well, uh, the first movie, you mean Ang Lee's Hulk? Ang or Lee's, Incredible yeah, Hulk? the one, the movie that Ang Lee, great director, Crouching Tiger, brilliant guy. Right. Uh, big, big. I'm a huge fan. Uh, it was not the right 
guy maybe for the movie. Uh, and we, I was at the premiere and, uh, uh, and it was, it, it, my wife Susie leaned over to me about five or six minutes in and say, and, and said, is, is it just me or is this the worst movie I've ever seen in my life? <laughs> and, it just, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, by the end, the only line that got a rise out of the audience guess what, was the one that I wrote uh, back in uh, in 77, where Bixby says, don't make me angry, you know, and right. that that got a, that was the only line in the whole movie that people went, oh, yeah, wow, yeah, and, and it's, but I'm, just to pay it off, as, as, the, as we're leaving and the lights come up and everybody's trying to sneak out of the theater because it's such a disaster. And what's um, funny, in this version of the Hulk right here, I don't know if it will show up on the, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of like, it, goes, it, it goes away, it flashes away. Yeah, there we away. go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it, it's called the Immortal Hulk. They brought um the reporter Jack McGee, but uh -huh. her name, but it's Jacqueline McGee. They gender swapped it, and they gave her a bit of a backstory about why she's obsessed with the Hulk is because the Hulk <laughs> destroyed her family, not intentionally. He she didn't he didn't kill her family, but her house was right. destroyed. Her mom and dad broke up, and right. and so she's had an obsession with tracking down and reporting on the Hulk ever since then. So well, she, as we're so they, as they we're as did that here. Yeah, as we were walking out of the theater at the premiere, though, one of the, I, think, I think it was one of the guys from Variety uh, reporters caught my arm and said, "Mr. Johnson, don't make me Ang Lee. You wouldn't like me when I'm Ang Lee." Ah. And I swear to God, and it was it was, and and uh, yeah, and but the, you know, it, I always characterize it, Chris, as if you were watching a Shrek movie, and suddenly there was a real human being in the middle of the Shrek movie. You'd go, eh, you know, this doesn't work for an, an adult mentality, and that's part of the reason that the first two movies did not work because no matter how good the CGI or whatever is, uh, it doesn't live in the same universe as as uh, the real people in the world, and uh, and that's why when Josh Josh did it in uh, in the, the first Avengers, where the Hulk was now one of a bunch of otherworldly characters with special skills and powers and stuff, then it could, and also he wasn't trying to carry the whole show. Uh, then it, that was the first time for me that, you know, that, uh, that they managed to make the creature work. I was, I was disappointed about the Norton version because, uh, and, and again, I never saw the whole picture, but um, I remember they said some really lovely things about me and about the show that we had done as a series in the, uh, in the seventies and eighties. Um, and when I saw some of the early comments and trailers, for the first, first 20, 30 seconds of the trailer, I thought, oh my goodness, look at that. They're, using, they're building sets exactly like mine, and they're trying to hit the, more importantly, trying to hit the emotional levels that were important and, and vital to make my series successful. And maybe this could work. And then the big green hand comes up out of the street, and, and, you, and immediately your mind goes into disconnect. And if you're an adult, you go, no. And both the first movie and the second movie fate, had the same fate. Both of them opened big on opening weekend. Uh, but the second week, they both fell off for like 75%. It was the biggest fall off from one week to week one to week two in the history of television, Hollywood. And it, it was just a disastrous. Did you have anything to do with the uh, the follow up films that came out in the uh, in the later eighties? The the no, four. I, I I didn't. I didn't. I, as a matter of fact, three three right. Return. I think there was, trial I think and there, death. Yeah, I think there were three of them. I had nothing to do with them. I I didn't even find out about them except uh, Robert Harris, who had been head of Universal uh, when we did the Hulk. Uh, I ran into him in a screening room in uh, Toronto when I was doing uh, Short Circuit Two up there. Uh, and he said, hey, Kenny, I, I, you know, we were talking. I said, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're right now we're producing some uh, the three the three Hulk movies. And I said, the what? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill had uh, never even called me about it, which was un unusual because Bill and I had a, a, a tremendous rapport and relationship throughout the uh, the whole situation. I went through the death of his child with him. I went through the suicide of his ex-wife with him, and as well as uh, a hundred, as well as ninety years plus hours of uh, uh, of filmmaking. And you know, so we we were we were really close friends. And I was so really sort of surprised that he hadn't even called to say, hey we're going to do this and uh, are you okay with that? Or we want to be, you know, so never happened. So we never really talked about it. Uh, but uh, I heard they were not of the same sort of quality that we had done before. And as soon as I saw that Thor was in one of them, I said, okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> each one other than like death, um, 
each one was like a, a, a launching pad to do to try and launch a character you know what i mean uh which yeah. is you know that works today you know flash launched out of the arrow and and you know one superhero show launches out of something else uh, I, NCIS, NCIS, yet, so I don't and, know what they're trying to launch out of that what and NCIS, all the NCISs were came out of uh, JAG. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good example. Um, but yeah, so you had Thor out of one, you had Daredevil out of another. Um, and I, I, I no, I never, I, I, I like them for the nostalgia of like I was a child when I saw them, and we didn't have Chris Helmsworth, we didn't have Charlie Cox at the time. This is what we had. We had your show. We had Spider Man. We had Wonder Woman. We had Batman. You know what I mean? It wasn't until late eighties and then to the nineties we had the glutton that of, of of projects that we did or whatever, which have just roller coastered into craziness today. Yeah. But um, there was when the Incredible Hulk was on, it was the thing that I was like, "The Hulk is on, we're gonna watch it." It's there's nothing else that matters. Well, it's you know, Hulk. The, it's, well, it's, he's the comic book character. He, he turns green. He smashes stuff. I hadn't read a Hulk comic book until I was probably an adult or at least a teenager uh, when I when I was picking out other marvel characters to read besides spider-man so my basis for the hulk was literally like he turned green he got angry that's it i didn't know anything about a rogues gallery or anything like that general ross betty none of that really mattered to me it was your show and then i found out about other stuff oh he turns gray oh he's also smart oh he's also uh, an abuse victim <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> yeah it's uh um it was uh did you ever have like David's like parents show up on the show? That never oh, yeah. happened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a uh, well, we did a show called Homecoming, right? And, okay. Uh, and it might have been with his just his sister. We did establish a sister that he had. Okay. Because uh, he's an only child uh, in the comics. I know that. Yeah. So so it was. Uh, uh, but Stan, it's interesting. Stan had always said that it was really the Hulk, our series, actually that really started the snowball of the marble that we know today rolling down the hill from the top. And uh, and Stan has, has been, had throughout his life was so complimentary and such a an wonderful guy and a great friend. Uh, and and he, 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 a couple of times he said in front of big audiences uh, that uh, he wished I had done all of his characters. Uh, and he said it's because the Hulk never would have taken off. Nobody really knew that much about it until our show suddenly thrust them, you know, into the uh, into the public consciousness. And the one of the most interesting things, aspects of it, and maybe we touched on this with Alien Nation, is just like, you know, we only have unfortunately like five minutes left on the Zoom call. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was yeah, I was going to say was the fact that the audience for the Incredible Hulk uh, was what the studios call a four quadrant audience. Uh, the, you've got adult men, adult women, you got teens, you got kids. If you have a four quadrant hit, boy, that's, that's gravy for everybody. But what was the best part of our four quadrant hit is that the largest single uh, section of audience that we, it was totally reliable and the biggest part of the audience was adult women. <laughs> and and uh, uh, and part of it, of course, I think, was because of the emotional qualities and, and characterizations and emotional structure that we tried to build into the shows, uh, and also, obviously, but my my casting of Bix, who was the only actor I ever sent the script to, and the, the guy that I wanted, uh, because I had seen his movie, his uh, TV play called Steam Bath, that he had done in in uh, 1973. You can still get it off of Netflix's D DVD lineup. Uh, and it's remarkable because you see Bix go through every emotion that an actor can possibly do in 90 minutes. And when I was writing the Hulk, he was a, who was in my head. That was a, that was going to be my uh, last and final question is because, you know, we still have Lou Ferrigno, thank God. So that's great. And he's still always doing interviews. But Bill Bixby mm -hmm. passed away a long time ago. For anyone not aware, his last project was like Blossom in the 90s. And then he passed mm -hmm. away, which is really unfortunate. Um, but and Jack, uh, Col you know, and Jack Colvin also has lost. Yeah, his... and Jack and and Jack as well played uh, who played McGee. Um, right. Talk about Bill Bigsby uh, for a quick minute and just just him as a person outside of the show. Bix, the guy that you saw on the screen as David Banner was pretty much the same guy that was he was he was warm he was human he was incredibly funny he did great impressions he would call my wife all the time and uh, him, him, him do his Cary Grant when he called up hello darling this is Cary calling is Kenny there you know and uh, uh, and we were uh, we were we were really 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 close and we went through well he went through a lot of personal strife during the time of the show as I've said 
uh, and it just made us closer together. And uh, uh, Bill was a total professional. We had a lot of arguments, knock down, drag out arguments, but it was always about stuff that was important, uh, Chris. There was, never, there was never any Hollywood nonsense, never any vapors, and I'll be in my trailer and go away, you know, none of that stuff. He was on the money even after his son died. Uh, you know, I said, you're going to need some time. He said, no, I got I to gotta get back on the stage and I got to keep working. And that's what we did. And uh, and the whole crew and cast, of course, was uh, in, was completely supportive. And uh, no, we were Have good friends. Did you see that statue coming? Sorry. Did you see there's a statue coming of him, um, in the Hulk? No. Yeah, I. I'm I don't trying know. to remember where I saw it. It was in the past year. Oh, Comic Con. Someone. It was debuted at Comic Con. There is a Incredible Hulk statue coming of Bill and and Lou. Where is it going to be? Uh somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, it debuted at San Diego Comic Con this past summer. It looks amazing. It's got, it's got, uh, it's got, it's got Bill standing in front of the grave with his head down, right. with his jacket, you know, with his jacket right. over his shoulder, and behind yeah. him, in the shadow above him, is the Hulk standing above him. Oh, that's funny. I'll tell you if I, I think I can get it in very quickly. Um, in the main title where he says, "You don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry." Uh, I don't know if I told you, but that's take two. Take one. He came out playing angry. I went, cut, cut, stop, stop. I said, Bix, it's a joke. And he went, oh. <laughs> and then he went back <laughs> and did it with that marvelous little twinkle that when I was putting the main title together, I said, we have to use that line. And uh, because it was just so perfect. I but just showed my son recently an episode of The Incredible Hulk, but then I also showed him like, do you want to know how he gets to that makeup? He's just like, yeah, it's not the same actor, is it? I was like, no, it's definitely not the same actor. But then I showed him a clip from the uh, episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where Mr. Rogers goes to the set of the Hulk. I love yeah. that. I love um, that so much. <laughs> it was it was really, really wonderful because he wanted to show the kids that this is Louie, but now when he puts the makeup on, that's when he turns into make-believe, you right, know? And, right. uh, and, uh, and, and Fred Rogers was just also what you saw was what you got. He was a real guy. Well, Ken, before it cuts us off, why don't you plug uh, your current book and project real quick? We got about less oh. than a minute. Oh, okay. Well, I've just got a new novel out. You can see about it at my website, which is kennethjohnson.us, kennethjohnson.us. Or you can go to uh, uh, Amazon and uh, and look for the title, Holmes Coming, as in Sherlock Holmes Coming. The title of the book is Holmes Coming. And, awesome. uh, and it's about the original Sherlock Holmes suddenly reappearing in contemporary San Francisco, the still eccentric, eccentric cocaine addicted, sexist genius, but he's just a hundred years out of sync. So sometimes his brilliant deductions are not so right. <laughs> and, well, uh, and it's Ken, a fun book. Thank you so much, Ken, for coming back on the show to talk about the 45th anniversary of the Incredible Hulk. My pleasure.